So the story I want to share with you today is from a friend I know who struggled with miscarriage. <coughs> her and her husband experienced two miscarriages early in their marriage and they were both very devastating for them. They wanted to have um, a healthy baby and of course they are so excited as new parents to start their family and when they experienced the miscarriage it was a, tra a traumatizing experience to having to go to the hospital, the bleeding, um, all the symptoms of everything following and we worked through a lot of healing for her to trust her body again and even try for a baby again and so sure enough um, about uh, five or six months later they got pregnant again they're so excited. We are like, yay, God has provided and um, he's answered your prayers. And then around 13 weeks, she miscarried a second time. And of course, it's like the enemy kicks you when you're down. And it took a long time for her to process and heal from these um, miscarriages. And so one day she was being prayed for by a group of women, a small group of women and they were praying over her womb, blessing her womb, blessing her uterus, blessing her body to be able to conceive and carry to full term. And all of a sudden, there were three women praying for her and someone said, wait a minute, all three of us are mothers of twins. That's kind of ironic, don't you think? And so they began to prophesy and pray twins over her womb. They said, it's, a, it's prophetic, you're gonna have twins. <laughs> Excuse me, and so the, the woman they were praying for, Erin, actually was a twin herself. She and her sister were twins. And so she said, I would love to have twins. And she's always wanted a boy and a girl. And so they began to prophesy and declare that she would have twins. And within a few months, they conceived. And sure enough, they conceived twins, a boy and a girl. Now, wow, yay God. It was so exciting. We all celebrated. And of course, there was that anxiety there is is this gonna is this gonna miscarry are we gonna have to go through the same pain and trauma and she didn't they she actually carried her babies to full term she ended up going in for an induction at about i think it was 39 weeks because the babies just didn't want to even come out now full term for a mom of twins is considered 36 weeks but many mom of moms of twins can go till 40 weeks um, and of course, by then you're big and giant and she had lots of uh, swelling and water retention and was very uncomfortable. So her doctors recommended it and she agreed she was ready to give birth. So she went in for the induction and of course it was a long process as inductions usually are. And so they're in the hospital, if, you know, in early labor, they're watching TV and joking around and then it gets more uncomfortable and it starts to drain on and she's getting fatigued. Um, and they're on the Pitocin and they're turning the Pitocin up and it, she reaches a point where she just simply breaks down and she's weeping and she's like, it's taking so long and I'm so tired. And I said, I know, honey, it's, it's a hard process. It's, it's a long time. And so, but in the midst of that, we turned worship music on and she poured her heart out to Jesus. She worshiped and, and sang and, and it broke that uh, hopelessness in the room. It was like God came in and shifted her heart. And sometimes, women, all you might need is a good cry to get labor really going. Sometimes that release of emotion can be exactly what you need to fully embrace labor. Now, sure enough, those, um, the contractions produced by the Pitocin were getting intense and she had planned on getting an epidural because she wanted to be able to be awake um, if they needed to do a cesarean. And in that case, she might not be awake without an epidural, they'd have to give her um, anesthesia and be put under for the birth of her second baby. And so she didn't want to miss that. So she said, I'm going to just plan on getting the epidural, but wait until later in my labor. So she got the epidural and we were joking because we were rotating her side to side in her bed to keep um, her to keep her pelvis balanced and, and ensure movement because we want to get lots of movement even with an epidural. And I remember one of her legs was severely swollen with fluid retention and the other one was swollen too, but uh, one of them was like her ankle was this big around. It had to be like, I remember trying to press on her ankle for an acupressure point 
and I couldn't even feel the bone in her ankle that sticks out. It was, it was like not even there. <laughs> and when I pressed in her skin to try to press on that pressure point, my, my finger just got like absorbed into the fluid. It just squished her body. There was so much fluid. And I said, oh my goodness, this must be so uncomfortable. And so we nicknamed that leg ham hock and we said okay we got to move ham hock over here so we can, so we can give it some massage and we did foot massage and leg massage and acupressure points anything to keep her comfortable and um, when she uh, gave when she was feeling the urge to push <coughs> they she began to push they waited a long time she didn't push too early and so she she waited a good, I think it was like two hours in between when she was fully uh, 10 centimeters dilated before she started uh, actively pushing. And she did have directed pushing where she's holding her breath and pushing because she has an epidural and it's kind of hard to feel how to push with an epidural. So oftentimes um, the doctors were instructing her and that was fine and she was doing great until about an hour into it. And then she started to get exhausted and then uh, two hours goes by and she's even more exhausted. And that baby, that first baby is coming down, but it's coming down really slow. And then three hours goes by and then four hours goes by and she is just done. She's exhausted. The, the, the OBs come in and they see her progress and they say, you are doing such a good job, honey. But we'd like to give you some assistance because this is, they realize it's going to be a few more hours. Because remember, you can only turn the Pitocin up so high before that baby has fetal distress. And with directed pushing and the force pushing, it tends to take a little bit longer, I think, because remember, all those sphincters are tightening around the baby. And without the normal, because she was getting an induction, she didn't have the full power of her normal contractions that oxytocin would produce. It was dependent on the Pitocin and the drugs in IV. And so all of that changes the body chemistry and um, made pushing take such a long time and exhausted her. And so they offer her a forceps delivery and she says, yes, I'd like to try that. The other option would be a cesarean section. And so they wheel her into the OR. We go from this dimly lit, wonderful room with worship music and aromatherapy to this huge bright lit OR with about 20 doctors in there because there was a team for her. There was the anesthesiologist, the gynecologist, the PICU team, one for each baby because there's two babies and you would not believe how many people were in this room. And so as her doula, I got next to her, her husband on the other side were telling her, you're doing great. You're just doing great. Just sink in, just connect with your baby. Don't pay attention to all these people and all these, these bright lights and machines. And it can be a scary experience for those of you who've um, had to go to the OR for a delivery or a C-section. And so they are explaining what they're going to do and they insert the forceps on either side of the baby's head and on the next contraction she pushes really hard and they are able to assist in the delivery of her firstborn. It's her daughter and they bring the daughter right up to her chest and she gets to breastfeed right there in the OR. They cover her with blankets. Another good friend of mine was there and she helped facilitate. She's a, a, a nurse practitioner for the NICU unit. She got to be there for her as well and she was able to um, help her breastfeed and do skin to skin right there in the OR even before the second baby was born. And so um, as the second baby got into a good position, they gave it some time and they found, okay, the second baby's head down, you can uh, push and we can deliver this baby now. So she starts pushing. They, they take the first baby and they, you know, um, the, the husband gets to hold the baby and they do, you know, a couple tests on it and she's pushing and you can tell again, it's going to take a long time. She is straining and she's exhausted. She's already been, you know, up all night and already had four hours of pushing four hours of pushing. And so the doctors offer her again, we can do another forceps um, assisted delivery if you'd like. And she's like, yes, please. <laughs> so they insert the forceps and they say, okay, on the count of three push. And she pushes really hard and out comes the second baby. And I think they were about 20 minutes apart. And these babies were healthy, full term babies. Um, and so they then lay the second baby on her chest 
and both of them look good. They have some bruising on their face from the forceps, but they're both alert. And all of a sudden, the mama who was just a moment, you know, a few minutes ago in her room, exhausted, ready to cry and crash and fall asleep, couldn't possibly do anything more. All of a sudden, she's perky and wide awake. She's actually saying, I have so much energy. I can't believe how good I feel. And you can see all of that oxytocin, all that adrenaline is at peak levels and the babies are wide awake nursing. They're looking at her. They're looking at the husband. They can hear their voices. She has one in one arm and the other in the other arm in the OR, still with her legs in the stirrups. The doctors are stitching her up because she did have a, I think, a second degree tear, but she doesn't care because she's just enthralled and falling in love with these two babies that God promised them, that they prayed for and they fought for. And so she's there in the OR, the little girl is nursing like a champ. She's like a little fierce little eating machine and the boy is kind of like trying to figure out his latch and get it all working and he does latch too. And so she's just there and I just thought it was this beautiful picture of what birth can look like even in a medicalized birth that has epidural and pitocin and a forceps assisted delivery that this mother still was able to get that golden hour postpartum period with both babies, twins in the OR, skin to skin contact on her chest, both of them breastfeeding and falling in love, instant bond and instant connection. Her heart was open and ready. The babies were healthy. And so the PICU nurses said, would you like to breastfeed? And of course I would. So they, we help her and there she is, beautiful beginning of life. And so she has since continued breastfeeding both her babies. They've done an amazingly well. And I know nursing one baby alone is hard and difficult and quite a learning curve. Nursing two babies at the same time as a new mom is even more work. You, won't, you don't have a free hand. You have to latch one and then somehow latch the other with like one hand or balance or have someone help you the feats that these twin moms go through i have so much respect for all you twin moms give yourself a clap it's hard work but i just want to share that story with you to give you a possibility of what's possible even in a medicalized or hospital birth you can still have that beautiful postpartum period that beautiful release of hormones the golden hour breastfeeding you can have a beautiful postpartum period even in the or with 20 people there you can bond with your baby